Hmm. There we go. I see we are live now. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, it says we are live on Facebook, on YouTube, on the website. So I will just wait a minute while people hop on. If you are there, you can type and say hello. Let me know you're watching. I see Debbie is watching on Facebook and Tina. Hi, Tina, on the website. Um, yeah, so uh, let me know you're there by commenting, saying hi. Um, good evening, Pastor. Hello, Debbie. Such respect. I love it. <laughs> and hi, Anna, on Facebook. And I can see Emily and Peter watching on the website. So um, also let me know. I know on Sunday we were having some major issues with the sound and it was pausing and, and jumping ahead. So if, if at any point it, it does that, um, let me know because the only thing I could do was try and stop the stream and restart it if we start having a whole bunch of technical issues. So let me know. Debbie says, no goodies tonight. I know, I'm kind of bummed, but that's okay. Um, I will try and survive. <laughs> so, um, thanks for joining us um, for week 14 of the book of Revelation. So, we are um, very quickly nearing the end of the book. We have five chapters left in uh, a book of the Bible that I have just found fascinating. Um, it's probably one of my favorite books the more that I have um, studied it and, you know, read commentaries and books about it. Um, I just love this book of the Bible. It's so good and so rich. And, um, you know, we've talked about all along that the book of Revelation for a lot of people is or has been in the past, you know, scary or confusing, or there was a lot of uh, fear connected to it. And um, hopefully as we've gone through, and I've heard this from lots of you, which is encouraging, um, that it's just kind of um, made a lot more sense, maybe, or that you've appreciated my, my point of, of view of how to discern and interpret this book. So that's been really good. So um, if you're new to watching, um, I'll encourage you that um, we try and make this as interactive as possible. So right now while I'm talking, I am monitoring Facebook on my phone and I've got YouTube and the website up on my um, iPad and just trying to keep track of all the comments. So if you want to ask questions or you want to make a comment or you have a different point of view or, or whatever it is, you need me to repeat something, um, please comment. That makes it a lot more interactive. And um, yeah, I love getting feedback. Hello, Lori Ann. And there's the Hillises. Awesome. Thanks for tuning in. Um, so yeah, we'll try and make it a, as interactive as we can. So um, we are going to be in, in chapter 18, all the way up till verse 10 of um, chapter 19. Um, oh, and Robert Fair is watching on YouTube. Hey, Robert, good to see you. Um, so the reason we want to look at that chunk is that it, it kind of, and you'll see hopefully as we go along, it kind of flows very well all together. Um, and... Uh, yeah, that's what we want to look at tonight, but we'll see how far we get. So the book of um, Revelation, as we've said all along, really it's a book about discipleship. It's a book of, you know, how do you and I as followers of Jesus remain faithful till the end? Um, how, like, and and you've, you've heard me say almost in every single chapter, there has been a call for perseverance, and it's worded differently, but almost in every chapter, it's, you know, this is a call for the saints to persevere. Remain faithful until the end. Right? You know, follow the Lamb. So really, the book of Revelation, you know, we've, we've sometimes viewed it in the past as this magic eight ball for the last seven years on earth, 
uh, and many of you that I've talked to, you grew up thinking that, right? That um, the book of Revelation was strictly about a uh, future seven-year literal time, the end times, and very chronological. But really, I, I, I don't think the book of Revelation is you know, a code to be cracked. It's not a magic eight ball for how everything's going to end. Really and truly, it's, um, it's a book about discipleship. In, in this in-between time between the first and second coming of Jesus, how do we actually live and make it, right, till the end? Um, and it's actually, the, the book of Revelation is meant to encourage us as believers as we follow the Lamb. Uh, and so, you know, I've said all along, it's not necessarily this very strict chronological, you know, this happens, then this happens, then this, this happens, right? Seal, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, then trumpet, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then bowl, one, two, three. It's not necessarily that, but we've seen, hopefully, there's this movement and momentum um, in the book as we get closer and closer to the return of Jesus. And, and so we've seen, you know, this book uses symbolism and imagery and metaphor and um, recapitulation where it, you know, it's like John, he's brought almost right to the end and then it, you know, doubles back and he sees something from a different perspective. That's what recapitulation is. So um, last week we looked at chapter 17, which described the harlot and the beast. And so we saw the harlot, which represented um, Babylon. Uh, you know, Babylon represents the ungodly world, right? Evil empires throughout history. And so we saw Babylon, who in chapter 17 was, was represented by this prostitute, this harlot. And it was this partnership between Babylon and the beast, and so um, we, we saw that, you know, evil has this partnership. And yet, you know, at the end of chapter 17, and I won't recap all of it, but at the end of chapter 17, we saw a couple of things. Um, Jesus is victorious, right? And I love that it's described um, that Jesus is victorious just by showing up, essentially, right? Verse 14 of chapter 17, it, it talks about the kings and the beast, and they make war on the lamb, and the lamb will conquer them for he is Lord of lords and King of kings. Why does, why does Jesus conquer, the, conquer them? Just because of, of who he is. Um, and then we also saw evil actually turns on itself. So we have the beast and the kings a- end up hating the prostitute at, at the end of verse, or chapter 17. And, and we read that actually that's all a part of God's plan, right? God puts it in their hearts to do this because it's actually carrying out his purposes. So again, another theme that we've seen all along in the book of Revelation is that God is completely sovereign over everything that happens, right? Even evil itself doesn't operate independently. Um, it actually, uh, you know, Satan and the beast, it, they use borrowed authority from God, right? So God is sovereign over everything. And so we saw that God puts it into their hearts to to evil, um, to, to turn on each other in, in the end. And that's part of God's plan. So now in chapter 18, um, we're going to see in a lot more depth the fall of Babylon described. And then in the beginning of chapter 19, um, we're going to see the, the followers of the Lamb, their response to the fall of Babylon. Of Babylon. So, um, if you have a Bible, you can follow along. I'm going to read the whole section. So, chapter um, 18 all the way up to verse 10 of chapter 19. So, it's a big section, so you can um, listen and follow along, and then we'll just kind of go through it verse by verse. So, Revelation chapter 18. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. And the earth was made bright with his glory. And he called out with a mighty voice, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a dwelling place for demons, a haunt for every unclean spirit, a haunt for every unclean bird, a haunt for every unclean and detestable beast. For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. 
and the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her, and the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. Then I heard another voice from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues, for her sins are heaped high as heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Pay her back as she herself has paid back others, and repay her double for her deeds. Mix a double portion for her in the cup she mixed. As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, so give her a like measure of torment and mourning. Since in her heart she says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. For this reason her plagues will come in a single day, death and mourning and famine, and she will be burned up with fire, for mighty is the Lord God who has judged her. And the kings of the earth who committed, who committed sexual immorality and lived in luxury with her will weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. And the merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her since no one buys their cargo anymore. Cargo of gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, all kinds of scented wood, all kinds of articles of ivory, all kinds of articles of costly wood, bronze, iron and marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle and sheep, horses and chariots, and slaves, that is, human souls." The fruit of which your soul longed has gone from you, and all your delicacies and your splendors are lost to you, never to be found again. The merchants of these wares who gained wealth from her will stand far off in fear of her torment, weeping and mourning aloud. Alas, alas, for the great city that was clothed in fine linen and purple and scarlet, adorned with gold, with jewels and with pearls, for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste." And all shipmasters and seafaring men, sailors, and whose, all whose trade is on the sea stood far off and cried out as they saw the smoke of her burning, what city was like the great city? And they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. Rejoice over her, O heaven. And you saints and apostles and prophets, for God has given judgment for you against her. Then a mighty angel took up a stone, like a great millstone, and threw it into the sea, saying, So will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence and will be found no more. And the sound of harpists and musicians, of flute players and trumpeters will be heard in you no more, and a craftsman of any craft will be found in you no more, and the sound of the mill will be heard in you no more, and the light of a lamp will shine in you no more, and the voice of bridegroom and bride will be heard in you no more, for your merchants were the great ones of the earth, and all nations were deceived by your sorcery. And in you was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all who have been slain on earth. After this, I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for his judgments are true and just. For he has judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality and has avenged on her the blood of his servants. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the 24 elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who was seated on the throne saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came a voice saying, Praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. Then I heard what seemed to be the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters and the sound of mighty peals of thunders, crying out, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory, for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure, for the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, write this, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And then I fell down at his feet to worship him, but he said to me, you must not do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your brothers who hold to the testimony of Jesus. Worship God. 
For the testimony of Jesus is the spirit of prophecy. Whew. So, um, I don't know. I would love to hear, you know, initial thoughts as you hear that. I know um, that that is a, a ton, but I don't know. What, what, what were initial thoughts or questions that came to your mind as we read that um, as I pour more coffee? Um, were there things that stuck out to you or questions that came to mind right away as we read that? If not, that's okay, because I'm sure questions will come up. Um, so as you probably noticed, um, chapter 18 deals in great detail with the fall of Babylon and then you know different warnings and responses that kind of go along with that. And then, like I said, chapter 19 shows the response from heaven. Right, so from followers of Jesus and the elders and the angels, etc. So it's like, you know, we're seeing in chapter 18 the fall of Babylon, and then you're seeing um, the kings of the earth, their response, and the merchants' response. So, you know, unbelievers, and then you're seeing response from heaven. And so that's why I wanted to do this whole section together because it's, you know, all uh, centered around this fall of Babylon. Oh, Lori, good. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, Lori said on Facebook that the, the phrase, you know, one hour is repeated several times. And, and you're right. That's, really, uh, that's a really good observation. So um, chapters 17 and 18, they're like this two-part theological account, right, of the empire, right? And, we, and so we've talked about that Babylon um, represents evil empires and the beast represents um, you know, the state that, that uh, is blasphemous and seeks to steal worship from God. And so you have this kind of two-part account. Um, and chapter 18 deals more specifically with the empire's, um, uh, its fate. And the, the fate that we read about is divine judgment and eventually just termination. And so like Laurie said, um, in, in verses 8, and 10, and 17, and 19, that, that phrase or some iteration of it, right, that this all takes place in an hour. And so what that is meant to show us is that the fall of Babylon, the fall of evil, and the empire happens very quick and very unexpected. That's why that phrase is used over and over and over, right? Like, in an hour, this happened. And, uh, and so, you know, verse 8 um, the plagues will come in a single day. Sorry, the, the day is used in, um, in verse 8. But then in verse uh, 10, it says, in a single hour, your judgment has come. In verse 17, for in a single hour, all this wealth has been laid waste. In verse 19, it says, they, uh, they wept and mourned, saying, in a single hour, she's been laid waste. So it shows us that the fall of Babylon, so you know, this is, ne this is at, at the end, the return of Jesus, the judgment of the evil empire, um, it happens very fast, which is super interesting. Um, so I'm going to reference it from time to time as well, but in these chapters, there's rooted, um, uh, or rather, what am I trying to say? John uses prophetic critiques from the original Babylon. So in the books of Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and Ezekiel, those prophets spoke of judgment against Babylon, the actual empire, right, in, in the Middle East. And so much of this imagery is actually borrowed from Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. And so we'll, we'll get into to some of that. So um, chapter 17 focused on the beast and the allies of, you know, this woman, uh, Babylon. And now in chapter 18, we're going to show that, you know, this, this fall that takes place. So in verses 1 to 3, there is a prediction of Babylon's fall. So we're told that um, an angel announces Babylon's judgment and its se uh, severe effects because of Babylon's idolatrous seduction of people. So we're given the reason that Babylon is judged and, and it will eventually fall. 
So verse 1 says, after this I saw, and I want to remind you, you know, that John says that lots, right? After this I saw, again, just a reminder, that doesn't necessarily refer to the chronological order of things. Um, This is just the order in which he saw the visions, right? So again, it's not necessarily the order of events portrayed in the visions. I think we've seen a few times that, you know, it jumps back and and, and John is seeing different points of history. So when, whenever we see that phrase, you know, after this I saw, it's just saying this is the order of the visions that John sees. So John sees an angel coming down from heaven, having great authority. The earth is made bright with his glory, and the angel calls out with a mighty voice, we're told, in verse 2. And I think that's probably... Um, to get the attention of any who were in danger of falling under Babylon's spell. So it's like um, uh, the angels calling out with a mighty voice, perhaps to wake up people who were being seduced by Babylon. Um, And so what does the angel say, right, in verse 2? He says, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. So here's, here's what's interesting, and sometimes in, in uh, prophetic judgments, um, this is a common thing that's used. The angel speaks in past tense as if Babylon has already fallen, right? So he's not saying in, in verse 2, Babylon, Babylon will fall. He's saying fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, and so the reason that the angel uses, um, you know, past tense as if Babylon has already fallen is because it, it's meant to point to the certainty of this judgment, right? He's narrating it in the past tense as if it's so certain that it's, that's a, it's as if it's already happened. Uh, and then the angel says, you know, she's become uh, a dwelling place for demons, for every unclean spirit, bird, detestable Beast, and this is actually a reference to Isaiah, where Isaiah talks about the literal fall of the nation of Babylon. So, um, in Isaiah 13, verse 21, this is describing the fall of the nation of Babylon. It says, But wild animals will lie down there, and their houses will be full of howling creatures. Their ostriches will dwell, and their wild goats will dance. And so there's, there's similarity here, right? So fallen, fallen is Babylon the Great. The, it's a haunt for all these unclean birds and spirits and detestable beasts. And actually in Isaiah 13, when it talks about wild goats will dance there, it's actually um, the Hebrew that's used is, is demonic. They're not just crazy goats. It's meant to be like demonic spirits. And so that's very similar to what um, Revelation 18 says, even in Isaiah 34, verse 11, it says, but the hawk and the porcupine shall possess it. The owl and the raven shall dwell in it. He shall stretch the line of confusion over it and the plumb line of emptiness and wild animals shall meet with hyenas. The wild goat shall cry to his fellow. Indeed, where the night bird settles and find for, finds for herself a resting place. So super similar descriptions, right? Isaiah is describing the fall of literal Babylon, and uh, John is seeing the fall of spiritual Babylon, but the descriptions are almost, you know, identical. It's just going to be destroyed. Wild animals are going to live in the city. No one's going to be able to dwell there, essentially. Uh, And then verse 3 gives the reason for Babylon's downfall. Here's why. Right? For all nations have drunk the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality, and the kings of the earth have committed sexual or committed immorality with her. And the merchants of the earth have grown rich from the power of her luxurious living. So we're given a few reasons why this judgment is um, is coming, because she's made, Babylon has made all the nations drunk, right, with the wine of her sexual immorality. And um, the, the kings of the earth have committed immorality with her. And the merchants have grown rich off uh, or from, from the power of, of Babylon. So when these verses use immorality, it means, it doesn't, 
um, necessarily means sexual immorality, even though that's the wording that's used. Um, it, it actually means acceptance to Babylon's religious and idolatrous demands in return for this economic security. And, and lots of times in um, the Old Testament, the idea of idolatry and worship of idols is, is likened to sexual immorality or adultery, right? So even um, uh, Isaiah 23, 17 says, at the end of 70 years, the Lord will visit Tyre and she will return to her wages and will prostitute herself with all the kingdoms of the world on the face of the earth. So, you know, how does a nation prostitute herself? Well, I don't think it means literal prostitution, right? It's talking about uh, there's this spiritual aspect to it. So the idea of sexual immorality and prostitution those images are often used of idolatry and worshiping false gods. So that's what these nations have done, right? Babylon representing um, ungodly uh, empires, right? And so that's what they've done. They've committed idolatry. And so Babylon, this spirit of Babylon has seduced nations to, to commit blasphemy and idolatry and it's likened to sexual immorality. And the phrase then, right, um, to drink, or all the nations have drunk um, this wine, it, it represents um, one's willingness to commit to idolatry in order to maintain security. So it's this image of, of nations, right, committing to that, in order, right, and so we see that at the end of verse 3, merchants are growing rich off of Babylon. And so the, the, the phrase to drink, it's this kind of willingness to participate in idolatry and immorality in order to gain uh, wh whatever, security, economic benefits. But, but then it's almost, it's meant to be, you know, as the nations have drunk, well, now they've become intoxicated, and that actually removes all desire to uh, resist Babylon anymore because they're all, they're all drunk now, right? So it, they, it's almost like their senses are gone, and they can't resist Babylon anymore, and so it numbs the senses to warnings of coming judgment. So that's the picture we get in verses 1 to 3. Nations have succumbed to Babylon's idolatry. They're getting drunk off of it. And then in verses 4 to 8, it's an actual um, exhortation to God's people to actually separate themselves from Babylon before Babylon is judged, lest they suffer with her. So a voice from heaven, we're told in verse 4, exhorts God's people saying, don't cooperate with the Babylonian system or you will suffer along with her in her just punishment, right? So that's what verse 4 says. Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins, lest you share in her plagues. Um, and there's a bunch of similar exhortations in the Old Testament to God's people. Um, Jeremiah 51, 45. Go out of the midst of her, my people. Let everyone save his life from the fierce anger of the Lord. Isaiah 48, um, 20 says, go out from Babylon, flee from Chaldea, declare this with a shout of joy, proclaim it, send it out to the end of the earth, say the Lord has redeemed his servant Jacob. Isaiah 52, 11, depart, depart, go out from there, touch no unclean thing, go out from the midst of her, purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord. So many times in the Old Testament, that kind of phrase is used, right? Come out of her, like depart from this nation so basically this this voice from heaven is saying hey believers get out of babylon essentially <laughs> and we're told why in verse five right this call get out my people don't take part in her sins lest you share in her plagues and here's why her sins are heaped high as heaven and god has remembered her iniquities um, so this is a metaphorical way of pointing out just the great amount of sin that Babylon commits. And so verse 6 um, talks about God paying her back. Um, 
it says, uh, pay her back as she herself has paid back others and repay, repay her double for her deeds. Mix the double portion for her in the cup she mixed. So th there's this idea of God repaying Babylon back for what she has done. And it, that middle, that middle uh, phrase in verse 6, repay her double for her deeds, some people have really struggled with that because it sounds like God might be contradicting his whole, um, the punishment fits the crime here, right? Uh, by saying, I'm going to repay Babylon double. And we've seen uh, fairly consistently through the Bible that there seems to be, you know, the punishment fits the crime. What, what um, and, and so we saw it earlier, right? Um, uh, Sorry, uh, back in chapter 17 that, um, oh, maybe not. Anyways, I was going to say, it, in one of the earlier chapters, it talks about that, you know, they spilled the blood of the saints, so God's going to make them drink. You know, so it's always been, you know, the punishment fits the crime. You reap what you sow. And so some people have looked at verse 6 and said, wait, that doesn't seem maybe like fair justice that God is paying them back double. But here's, here's what's interesting. Um, and here's why sometimes um, it's really good to go back to the original language because um, translators, like our English translations are really, really good, but sometimes there's Greek or Hebrew expressions that don't necessarily translate well. And so here, that, that repay her double for her deeds that's, that's actually a, a um, Greek phrase representing a Hebrew expression, so if you follow me, which literally means give back the equivalent. So, and so I don't know why um, scholars have translated it as repay her double for her deeds, because literally it, it means um, exactly what God's justice is like. You reap what you sow, give back the equivalent for what you've done. So um, the Greek and the Hebrew actually explains that a little bit better. Um, uh, so another example of that, Isaiah 40 verse 2, it's a similar phrase. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. And so that's a similar um, similar phrase which doesn't mean what in our minds in the English language it means it means that you have been given back the equivalent for your sins so hopefully that makes sense um so we know that God is perfectly just right and so all along in the book of Revelation the punishment has fit the the crime and so it's it's the same here right verse six pay her back as she herself has paid back others and, and then give her back the equivalent, essentially, is, is what God is saying. And then also, in the very next verse, in verse 7, it says, As she glorified herself and lived in luxury, give her a like measure of torment and mourning. So there it is again, right? As Babylon glorified herself, give her a like uh, measure. And so it's fair justice is what we're seeing God dispense here. Um, so also in verse 7, you see this attitude of, of, of Babylon, right? She says, I sit as a queen, I am no widow, and mourning I shall never see. And so there's this denial, right, um, from evil that anything bad is ever going to happen, right? She's not mourning, she's not a widow, I'm not going to see anything bad, God's not going to judge me. So... We're told for this reason in verse 8, her plagues will come in a single day. Um, death, mourning, famine, Babylon's burned up because God is mighty, we're told. Um, for mighty is the Lord God who's judged her. So again, you see the, the, um, the, the quickness of God's judgment and the fall of Babylon. These plagues come in a single day because God is mighty and he's judged her. So the question then to ask is, well, you know, if verses 4 to 8 is this um, call for Christians to come out of Babylon, right? Come out of her, my people, lest you take part in her sins. How do you and I, as followers of Jesus, 
come out of Babylon. Because Babylon is everywhere. <laughs> right? Um, and I, I don't think this is a call to, hey, let's go start a commune somewhere and um, set, you know, literally withdraw from society. I don't think that's what it means because even in the book of Revelation, what do we see Christians doing? We see Christians remaining in the world to witness, right? That's Revelation chapter 11, to witness and to suffer for their testimony. So we see in, in the book of Revelation, Christians are still in the world. So this call to come out of Babylon means that we're not to be of the world, right? It's not a call to physically leave the nation, any nation, any city, any empire that commits idolatry, because that's impossible. But what it is, it's a, it's a call to persevere, to be like Jesus prayed for his disciples, right? Don't take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one, right? Be in the world, but n not of the world. So it's a call to witness in Babylon, but do not be seduced by Babylon, which I think um, is actually a lot trickier, right, than just saying, well, we're just going to withdraw from the world, right? No, we have, we have a mission in the world to witness, to suffer for the sake of the Lamb, and it's a lot trickier to remain in the world and witness and suffer, but not be seduced by Babylon. So that's what, that's what God's calling us to. Now, verses 9 to 19, we're just going to kind of uh, fly over them because it shows those who cooperated with Babylon lamenting after Babylon is judged and, and falls. And so the reason that we see um, the kings of the earth and the merchants of the earth mourning and lamenting the judgment on Babylon, it bec it's because it, it means their own demise. It means their loss of financial security. So we're told in verse 9 that the kings of the earth weep and wail over her when they see the smoke of her burning. They stand far off in fear of her torment and they say, alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city, Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. So there's, again, a reference to the, the suddenness of Babylon's fall. And so what we see in verse 9, and then also in verse 19, if you jump ahead, they throw dust on their heads, they wept, they mourned. You know, alas, alas, for the great city uh, where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she's been laid waste. What we, we see is the devastation and the mourning of those who had actually prospered from their cooperation with the idolatrous economic system. And I think we saw that, right, in chapters 13, or rather chapter 13. You know, those who worship the beast are given financial security, and even they, they prosper, right? And it seems that those who follow the Lamb are at a disadvantage financially and they can't buy and trade and sell because they don't worship the, the beast. And so what we're seeing here is this, this uh, judgment of evil and we're seeing unbelievers, people, mourn because it affects them financially. Isn't that fascinating? So the close connection between idolatry and economic prosperity, it was just a fact of life in Asia Minor, in, in the ancient world. Because allegiance to Caesar and um, allegiance to patron gods of different trade guilds, that was actually essential for you to prosper. In some cities, you could not do business unless you were a part of a trade guild who then had to make sacrifices to patron gods. And so if you were a, let's say you were a blacksmith, right, and um, you wanted to be successful, you, you really had to join a trade guild, but that was totally wrapped up in idol worship. And so this idea of idolatry connected to economic prosperity, very connected in the ancient world. And I, I would say even um, in North America, the, there is a connection between, not always, but there's a connection between idolatry and economic prosperity as well. 
because I think you can, you can, in North America, you can make millions of dollars as long as you worship your job and money and power and influence, right? So idolatry, even in our day and age, is very connected to um, economic prosperity as well, which is an interesting thing to think of. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, if you have lots of money, you're necessarily an idol worshiper. But lots of times, the drive to make lots and lots of money and security and uh, financial uh, whatever uh, is connected to a worship of something. So I find that super interesting. So I- even in that day, if you would just bend the knee and commit idolatry, it often meant now you can be financially successful. So even in verse 11, right, we see merchants weeping and mourning. And, and look why, right? The merchants of the earth weep and mourn for her. Why? Since no one buys their cargo anymore. Isn't that pretty selfish, right? Evil is being judged and the merchants of the earth are weeping because no one's going to buy my stuff anymore. And then we get a big list. Gold, silver, jewels, pearls, fine linen, purple cloth, silk, scarlet cloth, scented wood, ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, and chariots. And then look at at what is very last on the list. Slaves. That is human souls. So does that tell you something about the upside down... um, value system of Babylon. Isn't that interesting? This evil empire and merchants are worried that they can't sell their goods and they list all of these other things and last on the list is people, meaning people are less valuable in Babylon than gold, silver, jewels, scented wood, iron, marble, all of these things. So again, you see, you know, and it's not, it's not blatant, but you see in those verses injustice right in Babylon no wonder Babylon is evil because it doesn't even value and uh, prize human souls over material things so it says these merchants right they stand far off they weep and they mourn for in a single hour um, all the wealth has been laid waste so they've lost everything essentially those who have partnered with Babylon and gotten rich off of this idolatry. Um, verse 19, all who had ships, right, who had, who had grown rich by her wealth, in a single hour she's been laid waste. So I find it fascinating that we see weeping and, and, and mourning from those who prospered from Babylon, not as a sign of repentance, but as expressions of sorrow over their loss of economic security. And I think we've seen all along, right, those who dwell on the earth, unbelievers, when they are confronted with um, God's judgment, oftentimes it, there's no repentance. It's just maybe another hardening of heart. Or here we see uh, sorrow, but it's sorrow for the wrong reasons, <laughs> So then in verses 20 to 24, we see another response to the fall of Babylon, right? So Babylon has fallen. It's this judgment on evil. Verses 9 to 19, you see a response from unbelievers, from those who had partnered with Babylon, who had um, become drunk off of her wine. And now in verses 20 to 24, you see the faithful, right? Followers of the Lamb, those who make it rejoicing over this fall right it says rejoice over her O heaven and saints and apostles and prophets for god has given judgment for you against her so we're told that saints and apostles and prophets and heaven is rejoicing because babylon has fallen and i want you to remember all the way back in in revelation chapter 6 right revelation chapter 6 describing how the church is going to suffer and be persecuted by Babylon, by the beast, by Satan, you know, God's people being persecuted in between the first and second coming of Jesus. And in Revelation 6, 9 to 11, we have these 
souls of those who had been killed and they asked God, how long before you judge and avenge our blood, right, on those who dwell on the earth? How long, God, until you judge evil and you avenge us? And now look at this, right? Twelve chapters later, it says, rejoice, saints, right? So that would include those um, under the altar, those who had been martyred, apostles, prophets. Why? For God has given judgment for you against her. Isn't that amazing? Because in, in Revelation chapter 6, God, it says that um, they're given a white robe. They're told to rest, right? Um, until the, the time is right, essentially, right? Um, oh, no, sorry. Rest a little longer until the number of your fellow servants and their brothers should be complete who were to be killed. So, the, the saints are told in chapter 6, just rest. And now we have God judging evil and, and they're told to rejoice. God has given judgment for you against Babylon. I think that's so amazing. I mean, God keeps his promises. He will judge evil. And now there's this rejoicing in heaven that finally, right, God has done what he said he would do. So the focus then in this rejoicing is not delight in Babylon's suffering, but it is a rejoicing because of the successful outcome of God's execution of justice. So this kind of rejoicing is not a, um, ha ha, Babylon. This rejoicing is, is not vindictive. Um, but it's rejoicing because God is good and faithful and just and, and he has judged correctly. So it, that's really important that it's not as if good is, you know, laughing and thumbing their nose at evil and going, ha, ha, ha. No, they're rejoicing because God is just. And then in verse 21, an angel takes a stone like a millstone, throws it into the sea and says, so will Babylon the great city be thrown down with violence um, and then it will be found in it no more. And then there's all these things. No more harpists and musicians, no more craftsmen, no more mills, no weddings taking place, no merchants. Like there's nothing that's going to be found in Babylon anymore. And that's actually um, uh, a reference to Jeremiah 51, verse 63. It says, when you finish reading this book, tie a stone to it, cast it into the midst of the, Euphrates, the Euphrates and say, thus shall Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster that I'm bringing upon her and they shall become exhausted. So this image of an angel throwing a stone into the sea that says, you know, that's Babylon to rise no more. It, it's actually pointing back to Jeremiah 51, which is another reference, right, to Babylon. So although um, chapter 18 makes many references, right, it points back many times to the Old Testament to refer to the little, literal fall of the nation of Babylon, um, spiritual Babylon, right, which, being, which, which is being described here, is not one specific nation at one point in time. But I think it rather represents all forms of evil government from the resurrection of Jesus until his return, Right, and so in John's day, Rome was Babylon. And so there have been many Babylons in between this first and second coming of Jesus. And so what we're seeing in Revelation 18 is at the return of Jesus, he will deal once and for all with Babylon, right? With evil, this empire that is opposed to, to him and to his people, so I don't know, any, any thoughts on chapter 18 before we um, kind of keep moving into this next section, which is connected, or um, any questions about that? If not, I'll just keep trucking along here. Because I think this first section in chapter 19... Um, is, is directly connected to this fall of Babylon. Um, and you'll, you'll see why in, in a minute. But in verses 1 to 5, 
um, we see that the declaration of Babylon's coming judgment is also the basis for the saints glorifying God's kingship, right? And so it's like um, into chapter 19, it's just carrying on, on, on this rejoicing in heaven that we see, you know, at, at, near the end of chapter 18, we just kind of get a, a, a bigger picture of it. So more rejoicing because of who God is and what he will do. And so in, in verse 1 of chapter 19, it says, um, After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of a great multitude in heaven, and this is what they cry out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belongs to our God. His judgments are true and just. And, and so why is there this rejoicing? Because he's judged the great prostitute who corrupted the earth with her immorality. And he's avenged on her the blood of his servants. So that's why there's this rejoicing. Because God has judged Babylon, this great prostitute. And then they cry out again, hallelujah. The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And then it says that in heaven, the 24 elders and the four living creatures, they fall down and they worship God who is seated on the throne. And they say, amen, hallelujah. And then from the throne comes a voice that says, praise our God, all you his servants, you who fear him, small and great. So the reason for this um, outburst of praise in heaven is because God has finally judged Babylon, right? He, he, and, and I think that's this is why this section is so encouraging because many people ask, right? There's so much evil in the world. There's so much wickedness. Why doesn't God do something about it? And Revelation 18 shows us that he's going to do something about it, right? Um, in his timing um, and in his, in his perfect plan. So the next time someone says that to you, right? Um, there's so much evil in the world. Why, isn't, why doesn't God do something about it? Tell them to read Revelation 18. Uh, maybe give them some context, but tell them that God is going to do something decisively about it, and then look at this rejoicing in heaven because God has finally rendered judgment. So then verses 6 to 10, uh, and the reason that I think that this, this connects will be apparent in a minute but verses 6 to 10, so think about it. We've seen the downfall of Babylon. We've seen rejoicing in heaven over the justice and judgment of God. And then John sees this marriage feast going on. Uh, and this is just beautiful, right? He, he, he hears this great multitude, um, sounds like the roar of many waters. And again, they say, hallelujah, the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory for the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her um, uh, to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. So here's what's really interesting about the Bible. Um, throughout the Bible, one of the analogies that is used of the relationship between God and his people is husband and wife. Um, I'll give you a few examples, but there are so many. Um, we could look at, you know, tons of examples, but Isaiah 54, 5 and 6. For the maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. Isaiah 61, 10. I will rejoice greatly in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness as a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. Um, Jeremiah 2.2, 2, I remember the devotion of your youth, your love as a bride, how you followed me in the wilderness in a land not sown. Even in John 3, um, 29, John the Baptist speaks this way about Jesus. The one who has the bride is the bridegroom. The friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly at the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is now complete. So John the Baptist says, you know, Jesus is the bridegroom. Uh, Ephesians 5, that whole passage, husbands, love your wife. How? As Christ loved the church, right? This picture of husband and wife. Even in 2 Corinthians 11 verse 2, Paul says, For I feel a divine jealousy for you, 
since I betrothed you to one husband to present you as a pure virgin to Christ. So put this together. Now, John sees the fall of Babylon, the fall of the harlot, right, the prostitute, And then he sees this marriage feast between the bride and the lamb, Jesus and his church. Now, I think that the existence of Babylon in between this first and second coming of Jesus served as a necessary preparation for the bride's marriage to the lamb, right? So what I mean by that is that the oppression and the temptation of Babylon was the fire that God used to refine the faith of his saints. And that's why in verse 7 it says, the bride has made herself ready, right? When Jesus returns, the church is going to be ready, right, for this marriage feast. And that's why Babylon is allowed to exist. That's why Christians throughout the centuries have been oppressed and they suffer and they're persecuted because God uses that to refine his bride so that she will be ready for this marriage feast. And so the angel says in verse 9, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then we see, you know, John is just so overwhelmed that he wants to, to worship the angel, but the angel says, you know, don't do that. We're, we're partners. I'm, I'm a fellow servant with you. Um, you know, worship God. So here's something that I find absolutely fascinating about these 10 verses in chapter 19. Maybe you picked up on it, but the word hallelujah is used a lot, right? Verse 1, hallelujah, salvation and glory belong to our God. Verse 3, hallelujah. Verse 4, amen, hallelujah. Verse 6, hallelujah. Did you know that this is the only time in the entire New Testament that the the word hallelujah is used? Um, I actually had to look that up because when I first read that, I said, that can't be right. But the only time that the word hallelujah is used in the entire New Testament is Revelation 19. Which makes, which makes you go, that's very interesting. You can look in, in no other New Testament book, in no other spot in the New Testament is the word hallelujah used. But in chapter 19, it's used four times. So the word Hallelujah literally means hallelu, which means you praise, and Yah, which is Yahweh. So it literally hallelujah means you praise Yahweh. So think about this. Revelation chapter 19, there's rejoicing over the fall of evil. There's this marriage feast of the lamb and the bride. And over and over it says, hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. So the Psalms are actually the place in the Bible where the phrase hallelujah is used the most. Um, And most specifically, Psalms 113 to 118. And those are actually called the Hallel Psalms. That's where the phrase hallelujah is used the most. And here's what's fascinating. These were the Psalms that were sung at Passover. Psalms 113 and 114 were sung together before the Passover meal, and then Psalms 115 and 118 were sung after the meal. So in Mark 14, where it says that Jesus sings a hymn with his disciples, they had just celebrated the Passover. So what Jesus and his disciples sang, most likely, was either Psalm 115, 116, 118, or or 117, 118, or some combination of that. Now, here's the thread throughout the Hallel Psalms, the Hallelujah Psalms. The thread, the theme that runs through those Psalms is God delivering Israel from Egypt. So, the the theme through the Hallelujah Psalms is God delivering his people from an evil empire. So, do you see how beautiful this is, (laughs) right? And I wish I could like hear like a, yes, amen, this is amazing. So hallelujah, 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 all throughout the Hillel Psalms, rejoicing that God saved his people from an evil empire. And Revelation 19, the only place in the New Testament where hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah is what? Rejoicing that God saved his people from Babylon, an evil empire. 
So I think it's just so beautiful and so fitting that in Revelation 17 and 18, you see the fall of Babylon, this oppressive empire that has persecuted God's people for thousands of years, and what better place in the entire New Testament to sing hallelujah over and over and over again, just like those psalms that, that remembered the Exodus. So I just, man, that's amazing. Um, and so this image of the marriage feast between the bride and the lamb, Jesus and his people, it's actually really beautiful and it helps when you know the marriage customs of the, of the day. So I want to I read, a, a, I, I photocopied this from a book, but here are some of the marriage customs of the day. And when you hear about them and then you hear about this marriage supper, it just, it makes perfect sense for most of, of the book of Revelation. So it says this, um, there were three steps in getting married. There was engagement, more technically betrothal, there was preparation for the wedding, and there was the wedding supper itself. So it says it began with the betrothal ceremony. So this is, you know, first century Jewish wedding traditions. The prospective groom would leave his father's house and travel, accompanied by his best man, to the prospective bride's house. There the groom would finalize arrangements with the bride's father, in particular settling on the purchase price. In that day, a woman was bought with a price. As soon as the groom paid the purchase price, the marriage technically went into effect. The man and the woman were legally husband and wife, although they would not live together for some time. She was declared to be consecrated to the groom, set apart exclusively for him. A new covenant was established between them, sealed by drinking a cup of wine, over which a betrothal benediction was pronounced, this cup is a new covenant. So I hope alarm bells are going off in your mind. Then the groom would leave the bride's house and return to his father's house. He would be away from her for roughly 12 months, during the period of separation, the groom would prepare a room for the bride in his father's house. And during this period, the bride would be preparing herself for the wedding. Now, although they did not see each other during this time, and although they did not have sexual intercourse, they were legally and spiritually bound to each other. So binding that if the man died during this betrothal period, the woman was considered a widow. To break the betrothal agreement was the same as divorce. At the end of the betrothal period, the bridegroom dressed in festive attire, accompanied by his best man and friends, they would make their way to the bride's house. Although everyone had a rough idea of when the groom would come, they didn't know the exact day or hour, and usually to add to the element of surprise, he would arrive around midnight. His arrival would be preceded by the shout, here's the bridegroom, come out, come out to meet him. And then with great joy, the bride, veiled and accompanied by her maidens who were carrying lamps, would come out and join the groom, and the wedding feast would begin. Um, after the, green, the groom took the wife, the whole bridal party would make its way to the groom's father's house. There they would find the wedding guests gathered and dressed in special robes, and the feast would take off, and it would last seven days, sometimes 14 days. So um, if you know your Bible, many of you have already picked up on the parallels that it's just so beautiful about the gospel, right? The, the groom would come to the bride and this ceremony would take place to betroth them and they would actually drink a cup of wine and, and, and it would be announced, this is the new covenant between this couple. And so you, you have Jesus in the upper room, right? And he does this celebration meal with his disciples. And what does he say? This cup is the new covenant in my blood, and then Jesus says that he's leaving. I'm going to prepare a place for you, right? And yet we as his bride, we are set apart and consecrated to him. And yet now we are preparing ourselves for what? For Revelation 19, the marriage feast, right? Um, and Jesus will come back. And we don't know the hour, right? And he'll come back and he'll get us. And then it says, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb, right? And Jesus has, has paid the bride price for us, right? His own blood. And all of these parallels are so beautiful. So now what Revelation is showing us is this waiting time, this in-between time, right? Where we have been betrothed to Jesus. We have been 
bought with a price through his blood. We have drunk the cup of this new covenant with him. And now we're in this in-between time where we are preparing ourselves for his return. And so the picture of Babylon then as a harlot makes total sense, right? We have been betrothed to Jesus. And so what the, the call throughout Revelation has been is don't be seduced by Babylon, right? Don't you, right? If you can, you know, you church, you're betrothed. You're technically married to Jesus. Don't be seduced by Babylon, right? And so you and I, as the church, we endure and we face hardship and we face persecution because it's actually meant to prepare us for this coming marriage feast when Jesus comes back to get us. So I, I don't know about you, but it is, it is just so exciting to read that one day when Jesus returns, um, he will judge Babylon, he will overthrow evil, and then what we see is this marriage feast that Jesus and us have been waiting for. So that's all I got. <laughs> I know that's a bad way to end it. I don't know, any... Any thoughts or comments? I mean, I just, um, I really hope that you are encouraged. Um, I, I, I found as I was preparing this section of Scripture just so overwhelming and encouraging and also convicting, like to not be seduced by, you know, the Babylon of the day, to not be seduced by idolatry in order for economic ease and prosperity but to be set apart and to look forward to this day when Jesus returns and we'll enjoy this great marriage feast right that we've been waiting for so um, Phil says I find it really interesting in verse 10 the details about John wanting to worship the angel and the angel's response yeah I know I didn't really spend a ton of time on that but you're right Phil um and, and it happens again, actually, later in, in, um, in, I believe it is Revelation 22. Um, it says, um, when I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who showed them to me. But he said to me, you must not do that. So John twice, whether he was just caught up in, I mean, it, it says, right, these angels are glorious and bright and they have great authority and they're powerful. So I don't know whether he was caught up in just the visual of what he was seeing, that the, the initial response was to just fall down and worship. But I love that in both cases, right, in, in 19 and in, in chapter um, 22, the angel says, no, 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 no. Like, don't do that, right? I am just a fellow servant with you. Um, you're right. That's a very interesting um, interaction between them. So, um, that's, that's what I've got for tonight. As always, um, I, I will post this tomorrow on the website and I'll put my, my notes with that as well if you want a copy of them. Um, yeah, and next week we're going to get into some interesting stuff, right? The rider on the white horse, the thousand years, the defeat of Satan, all these really exciting things. So, we are like fast approaching the end. So, um, Hopefully this has been helpful to you and encouraging to you as well. Um, if you have questions, even throughout the week, as you maybe read my notes or re-listen, you can always message me on, on Facebook um, or call the church office or whatever, and I can try and answer any questions you have. But um, thanks for joining me tonight. And you're welcome, Austin. I see that you said thank you. You're welcome. And uh, we'll talk to you next week.